Wedge Issues is brought to you by WISPolitics.com, a place where political insiders go for news, opinion, and campaign information. Once again, that's WISPolitics.com. Josh Call is a father, a husband, the son of Wisconsin's former Attorney General Peg Lautenschlager, a former federal prosecutor, and an attorney who successfully challenged some of Wisconsin's voting laws passed under Governor Scott Walker. He also likes spreadable cheese that comes in a tub, and he's running as a Democrat for Attorney General. I'm Jesse O'Poyan, and this is Wedge Issues, a Cap Times podcast about the 2018 elections in Wisconsin. My colleague, Caitlin Farrell, is covering the Attorney General race for the Cap Times, so she'll be taking the reins on this week's episode, which, if you haven't guessed it, is an interview with Josh Call. Yeah, we really we talked about, you know, money, politics, the issues. We also talked about beer and cheese. Uh, yeah, it was, a good, it was a good chat. Stay tuned for that conversation with Josh Call, but first we will check in on what's news this week. Welcome back to Wedge Issues. Jason Joyce, Cap Times News Editor. Thanks for joining me to round up the news this week. Thanks for having me. We're sort of smack dab in the middle of campaign season now. It's right in the thick of it. Yeah. yeah. Commercials are showing up. Mm-hmm. Um, both the governor candidates, yes, have their own commercials out along with a number of third party ads. That is right. Anything interesting in that area? Uh, Tony Evers and his the groups that are backing him seem to be, I wouldn't say staying completely positive, but definitely giving a more positive tone in their ads. They're still talking a lot about health care, talking about the contrast in terms of Scott Walker not accepting the federal Medicaid expansion, um, his previous support for repealing and replacing Obamacare. That's been a theme. But uh, the, the Walker campaign and some of the groups that are backing him are going pretty hard after Evers. They've been going hard on his record as uh, state superintendent, which we talked about last week in terms right. of these um, teachers whose licenses weren't revoked after they were behaving inappropriately at school. Uh, the new development in that this week, they've got a new ad that's not just going after that, but also going after... Uh, Evers and, and just about every Democrat in the primary field who was running for governor has said that they'd support reducing the prison population significantly. In right. fact, cutting it in half, um, the argument of sort of when, what are the deadlines and how do you actually cut it in half makes this question uh, arise that, that is, would you have to release violent offenders in order to do that? Or are we looking more uh, years ahead in, in terms of, of that reduction? So. This new Walker ad is, you know, pretty scary, showing some mugshots of some people in prison who committed some pretty heinous crimes and raising this sort of hypothetical of if we cut the prison population in half, which one of these guys are you going to release? Yeah. What I think is interesting about that discussion is that it's taking place at the same time that former governor Tommy Thompson is sort of making the rounds to promote his memoir, which is just out. Mm -hmm. And one of his um, his issues in these live discussions, and uh, he actually brought this up at last year's Cap Times Idea Fest, is the state has too many prisons. He feels like he built too many prisons as governor that they're putting away too many people in prisons and perhaps most importantly uh those people when they are released and the you know the truth is the vast vast majority of them will be released someday leave prison without any discernible training or skills or the ability to go to work which of course then drives recidivism yeah that's right i mean that conversation's going on we're having the conversation at the same time at the legislative level of whether the state needs another prison and it's all happening too in the context of the juvenile prison lincoln hills uh, being shut down and the whole juvenile justice model being uh, overhauled and, and redone after years of allegations of abuse of inmates and mistreatment of staff. Uh, the state just came to another settlement this week that will uh, end the use of pepper spray and reduce the use of solitary confinement, paying, I think, 
more than eight hundred thousand dollars in this case, and it's there's still other lawsuits uh, going forward. So there are a lot right. of different conversations going on in terms of what should we be doing about corrections. And this element is now working its way into the governor's race. I mean, it's not just a human interest issue. It's a it's a financial um, bottom line issue, too. If if people continue to sue the state and win, then they will be out money. And we're also learning, of course, that when um, kids who serve time in these juvenile prisons are mistreated or aren't, you know, rehabilitated and and, um, you know, sort of set free with with some real prospects, society will be on the hook for the expenses of incarcerating them deep into adulthood and just doesn't seem to be sustainable public policy. Yeah. Interesting. So the Senate race also going on sort of parallel to this, Leah Vukmir has come out with a new sort of positive, uh, you know, self uh, self promotional. I mean, they're all self promotional, <laughs> right. right? But a little more biographical. R- yeah. yeah, her, yeah. Her, that type of ad, because now she's in the position of being a, a challenger who is trying to, um, to get ahead of, uh, you know, how she's perceived by the electorate. What's going on in that race? We're going to hear a lot in that race about health care and veterans, if this week has been any indication of what's to come. Uh, Leah Vukmir is reminding folks that she is a nurse. Uh, in addition to her time as a legislator and a mother, she has worked as a nurse. And so I think when Tammy Baldwin tries to go after Leah Vukmir on health care issues, Leah Vukmir likes to come back and remind people she has worked in the health care field. At the same time, Leah Vukmir is going after Tammy Baldwin for her involvement in the uh, overprescription scandal at the Toma VA, which we've heard a lot about over the last few years. Um, you know, Tammy Baldwin's office was accused of sitting on a report that detailed um, some overprescription of opiates that was going on at the at the Toma VA. Um, that issue came up in the Senate race between Ron Johnson and Russ Feingold. It was pretty convoluted. Then I think Leah Vukmir's going to be able to paint a probably finer point on it during during this race. But yeah, we're we're hearing a lot about from from Leah Vukmir about that. We're hearing from Tammy Baldwin about Leah Vukmir supporting repealing the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. A lot of Democrats are trying to make this conversation about coverage of pre-existing conditions, and Republicans are arguing that pre-existing conditions can still be covered even if Obamacare is repealed. Sure, it gets in the weeds pretty quickly. Yeah, I don't know how effective either side's message is on this at this point, but that's what we're hearing about right now. Yeah, that's interesting, um, especially when again we're we're we keep being told that the um, important demographic to pay attention to in this midterm election are suburban women uh, mothers. I mean, it's funny. They used to be called soccer moms, right? Now right. They're just suburban women. But that is, that's an important demographic. And you've got to, you've got a race here with two women running against each other. So they, they may make appeals traditionally targeted toward that group, which would be healthcare. Right. And so later on this podcast, Cap Times reporter Caitlin Farrell has an interview with Josh Call, um, and we need to make sure people understand that the attorney general's race is also very um, heated uh, between Call and uh, the incumbent Brad Schimmel. We so far haven't seen too much emerge from that in terms of, uh, you know, sort of a public debate. That's right. We've seen a handful of ads either coming from Schimmel or, or people supporting him. Uh, it's been pretty quiet so far. It's easy for this race to be overshadowed by the really high profile Senate race and the really high profile and crowded up until a few months ago race for governor. But this is happening. Um, it's an important race as well. Excellent. So looking forward to this interview and uh, paying more attention to this race along, of course, with the uh, Senate and the governor. I guess if you could tell me a little bit, maybe just give me a, a rundown again on who you are and your your background. I know you obviously worked in Baltimore, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the types of cases you worked on and then some of the private litigation you've done and what things really led you to, to run this time for AG. Yeah, so I'm Josh Call. Um, I'm the Democratic nominee for Attorney General. Uh, I grew up in Oshkosh and Fond du Lac, um, and I grew up in a family that was deeply involved in public service. Um, my mom was a prosecutor and elected official. My stepdad, Bill, was a police officer in Nina. Uh, my mom's parents were both public school teachers in Fond du Lac. Um, 
And so I grew up, um, you know, seeing uh, both that the impact that they were able to have through public service, but also how much it meant to them to do that work. Um, so I had the opportunity to spend part of my career as a federal prosecutor in Baltimore. Um, I was in the narcotics division in Baltimore, and so I, I worked on cases involving uh, large-scale drug trafficking. Uh, I worked on cases that involved uh, gangs and homicides uh, as well, and worked to make communities safer. Um, I've also gone to court to challenge laws that restrict access uh, to voting. Uh, so I've gone to trial in Arizona, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, and Ohio. Um, but the case that I'm proudest of uh, in the voting rights front is a case we tried here in Wisconsin where we challenged more than a dozen different laws that restricted access uh, to voting here in Wisconsin uh, that were enacted in Scott Walker's first term, uh, as well as a law that limited early voting to one location per municipality, no matter how big the municipality was. Uh, and so I'm running for attorney general now for, for a lot of reasons, but the fundamental one is that I think uh, we need new leadership in our AG's office, and I want my family and families throughout Wisconsin to live in a state that's safer and stronger than we're on track for right now. And there's so much that an effective attorney general can do to help us move in that direction. Could you unpack a bit more maybe what specific things you think are not being done that you want to do to help us move in that direction? Yeah, so I think we need new leadership when it comes to fighting crime and getting justice for Wisconsinites. Um, We have an opioid epidemic right now that has been devastating for families across the state. We have a growing meth problem. And I think we're not going to beat that epidemic until we start responding to it like the crisis it is. Um, I think we need to make sure that our enforcement efforts are targeting large-scale drug traffickers, people who are sending drugs across county lines and state lines. Uh, But I also think that we need to make sure that we're investing in treatment far more seriously than we have so far. Uh, And then we have an AG who's serious about holding pharmaceutical companies accountable for the role that they've played in in this epidemic. Um, That's one example. But I think we also need to... um, Uh, I think our AG has mishandled our backlog of untested rape kits in his first year in office. We received millions of dollars to test those, but only nine of them were tested in his first two years in office. Um, I think that should have been a priority from day one. And I think um, making sure that when there are DNA hits, that we're uh, following up on those and fully and thoroughly investigating them is important. Um, And I think we need to do more on school safety. I think, you know, our, our current AG has suggested arming, that we consider arming teachers He's criticized gun-free school zones. Um, I think we should be advocating for some common sense gun safety measures like universal background checks. One of the things, too, that I guess on a few of those issues, Schimmel has has emphasized the the backing he has from law enforcement and and has, you know, we've seen roll out a lot of school safety grants uh, over the last several weeks. And he he often raises that up as, as showing that he is doing something and that um, you know, law enforcement and prosecutors across the state are really supportive of, of what he is doing. Do you have thoughts on, um, I guess, or a response to where that still might fall short, even, you know, especially for voters who might hear this and say, yeah, but he's giving millions of dollars away to schools for, for school safety improvements. Um, and, you know, he's done a lot of uh, drug take back programs. They've put out a lot of release, releases about the types of stuff they're doing there. Um where do you think he's still falling short when it comes to holding some of the pharmaceutical companies accountable, but then maybe not doing enough when it comes to school safety when we hear all this stuff kind of that he has been doing over the last few weeks? Yeah, so we um, recently announced uh, the endorsement of 61 former assistant attorneys general. Um, those are people who uh, know the office very well, and um, I was proud to have them supporting our campaign. Um, when it comes to the opioid epidemic, the the bottom line is that the problem continues to get worse. We've had an increase in overdose deaths. We had almost 900 opioid-related overdose deaths in Wisconsin last year. So I, you know, I think that that is a, a, a clear indication that we need to be doing uh, more to address that. Um, uh, and and it, the problem is getting worse in Wisconsin, even relative to other states. And so that's why I think you know, ensuring our enforcement efforts are targeting large-scale traffickers, expanding access to treatment is important. When it comes to the pharmaceutical companies, as you were asking about, um, you know, our AG has not shown a serious commitment to holding them accountable for the role that they've played in this epidemic. Um, It was, I think, around the beginning of 2017 or late 2016, he said that, you know, he didn't think the statute of limitations could be stretched back far enough to hold the pharmaceutical companies accountable. He's taken campaign contributions from PACs for pharmaceutical companies. Um, I think our AG should, be, should make clear that 
Um, we're going to hold pharmaceutical companies accountable for any false and deceptive marketing practices that they've made that have been harmful to Wisconsinites. And on school safety, um, it's true that he has been uh, distributing grant funding. I mean, that was passed by the legislature, um, and so he's distributing it. But, you know, they were supposed to have those funds distributed by the beginning of the school year, uh, and they haven't been. Um, but the other thing is that's a one-time grant. You know, to fund mental health programs in schools over the long term, as I think we need to do, uh, we need a long-term source of funding so that schools can hire mental health professionals, counselors. Uh, and, and again, we also need some common sense gun safety measures. I think arming teachers is, is an alarming suggestion. And instead, we should be working to make schools safer with policies like universal background checks. And one last thing, on, and then we can <laughs> pivot to other things, but on the opioid issue, I think this is something you've talked about in the past um, and has come up to Schimmel. I, I think virtually every county in the state at this point has signed on to wanting to, to sue the collective pharmaceutical companies for for what they've done as far as deceptive practices, and other states have joined a multi party lawsuit to to see that roll back. But um, Schimmel has instead taken a different route, which is an investigation, a kind of uh, negotiation process where they're hoping to get some settlement funds. Um, what are your thoughts, I guess, on that route? And would you what would you do differently as far as um, and there's been some criticism on for his role in, in, in deciding not to sign on to the lawsuit that many other states have at this point in trying to hold those companies accountable. Yeah, it's, it's, I believe it's 71 out of the 72 counties in Wisconsin have now filed suit. Um, so first of all, our AG should have made clear uh, long ago that this is a priority, um, holding pharmaceutical companies accountable. I'm glad that he has now um, made clear that we're part of a multi-state investigation. That's a step in the right direction, I think. Um, but our AG should have been a leader on this issue and instead I don't think we've had real leadership on this, um, and, and I think that's part of the reason we've seen counties um, act independently. I don't think they have a sense of what the AG is up to. Um, as AG, what I would do is see where the, we are in the multi-state investigation, um, look at, at, at where things stand, and if it looks like that's a route that's going to lead to action uh, you know, in the relatively near future and it's a, it's a promising route, you know, go forward with that. But if, if it's not being effective, um, if it's too slow, um, then I think um, looking at actions for going to court is, is, is what we should be considering. And again, at, at the end of the day, we want, I think we need to have an AG who's making these decisions, who is serious about holding the pharmaceutical companies accountable, not somebody who's, been, who's received campaign contributions from PACs for pharmaceutical companies. Could you talk a little bit more about just this letter with, you know, it started out with former DOJ employees, um, assistant attorney generals. I think it was 40 some and then it jumped up to over 60 at this point. Um, Could you just tell me a little bit about some of the people who have signed on and how you ended up? Did they kind of group themselves and then come to you and say, hey, we want to let you know we've organized? Um, And then one other thing with that, I know the response that came from the Schimmel campaign and in light of that was just that they're just political hacks um, who and they were all hired by Democrats. And so if you have any details about who they are and um, how that came about, yeah, if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah. So there there are, I guess, two different things. One is um, 61 assistant AGs have endorsed uh, my campaign for attorney general. Uh, And then there was separately a letter that 45 uh, former assistant AG signed, and I think it was 45 out of the 61 um, oh, who endorsed. Okay. Um, or if not exactly, it's very close to that. Okay. Um, but they, they're, you know, I, I think what that letter reflects is that there are a lot of people. Um, they, they collectively, uh, those 45 uh, former assistant AGs, collectively worked uh, over 900 years at the State Department of Justice. So the idea that these are partisan activists is just totally inconsistent with that, that these are people who have put in substantial time working to serve this state. And frankly, that suggestion that they're partisan hacks is reflective, I think, of how our current AG um, views folks at the Department of Justice, which I think is really disappointing. Um, There are some really talented attorneys there who are working to, uh, to work for the state. Um, and we should empower them to do the work of the state of enforcing our environmental laws, enforcing our consumer protection laws. And so, uh, so I, I actually saw from, uh, I think, a Cap Times editorial that uh, 10 of those um, former assistant AGs uh, had worked under Brad Schimmel, and I think 20 of them had worked under J.B. Van Hollen. Um, so, you know, this is a group that has um, worked under, at least 20 of them have worked under Republican AGs, um, it's a group that put in a lot of time 
working for the state. And, you know, people who have spent uh, that amount of time working for the state care deeply about the agency and the Department of Justice. And as that letter reflects, they, they think it is being mismanaged and, and that we need a change in our AG's office. And I agree with them. Have you had a chance to um, sit down and chat with any of them individually about some of what their experiences have been or what specific things within the, the department um, were being mismanaged or were problematic? I've spoken to some former assistant AGs, but I think the letter um, sort of lays out how those AGs feel about the office. I think um, there is, I think it, the office has become uh, partisan, uh, especially um, through some of the lawsuits that our AG has filed. Uh, just yesterday, the, the state solicitor general was in court arguing that the Affordable Care Act should be invalidated, um, which would mean that protections for people with pre-existing conditions would be eliminated. Uh, but the AG has also gotten the state in suits uh, challenging other policies that were enacted under the Obama administration, including a rule that guaranteed overtime pay for people who put in the hours and make between about twenty-three and forty-seven thousand dollars a year. Um, he's challenged environmental regulations, um, and so you know the the heavy partisanship there I think is clear. But but also you know when it comes to um, uh, enforcing our laws, the, the fines that have been collected from polluters have dropped significantly, even compared to when J.B. Van Hollen um, was in office. When it comes to criminal justice issues, we've talked about some of the places where uh, I think our AG has dropped the ball, although one we didn't discuss is the increasing delays uh, in testing times at the state crime labs. The time it's taken to test DNA evidence, for example, has increased significantly since Brad Schimmel has been AG. Um, so I think I think a lot of those concerns are summarized in the letter. And so I guess you sort of outlined it a little bit here, but um, just speaking about the politicization of the office, I mean, we've seen, and this isn't really specific to Wisconsin, but an increase in money that has been poured into these races and AG races, um, you know, nationwide with the Republican Attorney General's Association and the Democratic Attorney General's Association pouring millions of dollars into the state. And we've seen, you know, an increase in, in lawsuits originated at the state level, you know, towards the federal government, both from Republican AGs and and now Democratic AGs targeting initiatives from the Trump administration. And um, do you have thoughts, I guess, on, um, you know, and again, I know that's that's a trend that, that it goes beyond, you know, Brad Schimmel's time in office, but that I know many arguably say he's been right there at, at, in the front of. And so, I mean, are, are you an advocate more for really taking that completely out of the equation? Or, I mean, would you be a party to other Democratic AG lawsuits that might target Trump administration policies? Or what are your thoughts just about this trend that we're seeing there um, with this office that, you know, didn't really exist as much before, uh, even just a decade ago or five years ago? Yeah, so I think that when it comes to challenging policies that are enacted by the federal government, there, there are two things that our AG needs to consider. Uh, number one is, is the policy that's being challenged, is it unconstitutional or was, is it a regulation that was uh, adopted in a way that, that breaks the law? Um, and if the answer to that question is yes, then the question is, is this a policy uh, that's harmful to Wisconsinites? Um, if it's a policy that helps Wisconsinites, we, you know, I don't see the interest in challenging it. And the Affordable Care Act lawsuit is a great example of that. Um, you know, I, I think that by going to court to fight to take protections away from people with pre-existing conditions, Brad Schimmel is acting against the interests uh, of Wisconsinites. And so that's not a suit um, that I would have gotten involved in. And as AG, um, I would seek to withdraw from that lawsuit. Now, um, if there are policies um, that the federal government has enacted or adopted that are harmful, uh, then I think we should step up. And, that, and that's true regardless of whether the president is a Republican or a Democrat. Um, and so I'll give you an example there. Um, net neutrality uh, was eliminated by the FCC recently. You know, I think net neutrality ensures that um, we have a fair and level uh, internet and a, and a free and open internet. I think it is uh, important for consumers. I think it's important for small businesses. Um, and I think it's just fundamentally fair to have um, that type of system. And the public overwhelmingly supports net neutrality. Uh, the other thing is the FCC received a, a, a very large number, I think it was over 2 million fraudulent comments um, during the rulemaking process. Um, and, and so there is a challenge that has been filed to the elimination of net neutrality. That I think Wisconsin should have joined. I called on Brad Schimmel to join it. Um, he called it frivolous. Um, I think that that's wrong. Um, and you know, so that's a suit that I think Wisconsin should have been a part of. So I think it's a, it's a question of 
uh, is this case in the interest of Wisconsinites, and is there you know, a strong legal basis for challenging uh, the law or the, the policy? And I know the, the office that you were just saying, the Solicitor General, you know, was just in court arguing on this on this score um, this week. And that office and the the expand the creation of it, and then the ex- the subsequent expansion of it during Brad Trimble's tenure has been um, a source of controversy and criticism among some. W- would you, if you were elected, would you keep that office intact or alter it in in any which way? I mean, I know many of those the folks in those positions are. Um, political appointees. But uh, what are your thoughts, I guess, just about, you know, the having at least one person in that position, but then having this this larger office that has now taken those types of cases? I would change the way it operates. So I think having somebody who's called the Solicitor General, who, um, you know, I think that that is, that's something I'm, I support. And I, I think it signals to court that this is the person who's the top appellate lawyer uh, in the state. But what I would want to do is have that office be working together with um, people who are doing appeals um, uh, at the Wisconsin Department of Justice, not have it be its sort of own separate uh, office. And, and I also think we don't need as many people there as we have there right now. I'd rather see those resources shifted um, into positions, hopefully having folks who can um, be moved to criminal litigation and help work to address um, things like our opioid epidemic, our growing meth problem, and you know other criminal justice issues that we need to deal with. Wedge Issues is sponsored by WISPolitics.com. You can become a WISPolitics.com member. Find out more at WISPolitics.com slash membership. So dialing back a little bit <laughs> to your maybe earlier years, but so, you know, um, your mother is the late Peg Lautenschlager who did serve in this role years ago. Could you maybe talk a little bit about sort of what you learned about the office from her and, and what it was... Um, yeah, just kind of how, you know, she might have shaped your your view and approach to, to what she did and thoughts just about seeing her in the role and, and the way that she she served in it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, broaden it a bit and talk just about a bit about my family, I guess. So, um, you know, I mentioned before that in addition to my mom being in public service, my stepdad, Bill, was a police officer. My grandparents were public school teachers. Um, and, and growing up seeing, you know, um, uh, how much it meant to them to do that work, but also, you know, uh, knowing that the work they were doing was having an impact is something that made um, public service uh, seem uh, like a, like a great route uh, to go down for for part of my career. And so, I think growing up seeing that is is part of what inspired me to to go into public service for part of my career and to become uh, a federal prosecutor. Um, you know, my mom was always committed to working to make community safer and, and to, to fairness. And I think those are values that are, are good ones um, for anybody uh, in the system to have. And so, but, but certainly seeing the example of uh, family members who were in community service is something that, that had an impact on me. And as you saw that growing up, what was the best piece? Well, this is, we're going to do a slow wade into our lightning round where we <laughs> ask you questions about food and personal other fun things. Uh, <laughs> what would you say in, in that vein of, of, you know, this environment, this climate of, of public service and, and helping other people? What, what's the best piece of advice that um, your parents or, or someone in your family gave you about about that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, wh- one thing that I, um, I've heard in, in different ways from different people, but I, you know, the, the, the golden rule, which is treat other people the way you want to be treated, be kind to people. Um, that's something that I think makes a, a big difference, and I think it's how we should, you know, I think it's a good way to go about approaching things. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Are there any other political role models that you have <laughs> that you would like to talk about? <laughs> um, no, that's a great question. I, um, uh, Barack Obama is so certainly somebody who I would count as a political role model. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are other people too, but, um, but that's one who comes to mind. Um, uh, yeah. How come? I, I, you know, I think that um, he, first of all, he's obviously incredibly inspiring. And I think that uh, he is somebody who fundamentally was committed to working to make our country um, stronger. And, um, you know, I, uh, to this day, I think he, you know, continues to comment on issues uh, of importance and, and in a way that I think is uh, meaningful, and I think uh, you know, I think he's somebody who's just demonstrated a real commitment to you know to making the country stronger. I, we were you know talking before about 
the pre-existing conditions uh, part of the ACA. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, you know, that's something obviously he pushed for. Um, it wasn't always politically popular, certainly. But as a result of, of the work that he and a lot of other people did, people with pre-existing conditions now uh, aren't being denied health insurance coverage uh, because of those pre-existing conditions. And that makes a real difference uh, in people's lives. And so I think that that's, you know, that's one uh, really incredible accomplishment. But it, it shows, I think, that not only was he somebody who was really inspiring, but he's somebody who got some really important stuff done. Yeah, I guess just to, in a soundbite, or short nutshell, obviously you're, you're you're facing an incumbent and who has wide name recognition statewide. For folks who might not at all really be familiar with you or super tuned into this race, what do you think is really like the one takeaway you feel like voters should understand about who you are as a contrast to Brad Schimmel? Uh, you know, I am I'm a dad. I have um, sons who are four and one. Um, I'm a former federal prosecutor, and I'm running because I think that our AG's office can do more to work to make Wisconsin safer and stronger. And I think our AG far too often has uh, put the interests of special interests uh, ahead of the interests of Wisconsinites. Uh, And I think that needs to change. And so do you like beer? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Are you going to ask me what my favorite beer is? Is that where Indeed, this is Indeed, yes. Yeah, so we're, we're walking down that path. Do you like Wisconsin beer? Yes. So, um, <laughs> so I, I'm uh, I'm a fan of Penguin Pale Ale. Okay. Um, uh, but I, favorite Wisconsin beer is a tough question. Um, I also like Moon Man, um, mm-hmm. Liney's Red. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but um, but yeah. I uh, yes, I'm a fan of Wisconsin beer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, and what about Wisconsin cheese? Uh, yes, um, we as <laughs> pro Wisconsin cheese. As you know, as we were walking over here, we were discussing whether cheese that comes out of a tub that you can spread on crackers counts as cheese. Um, but uh, I think it does. But <laughs> do you want to talk about what spreadable cheese you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I'm with you, port wine. But yeah. um, but uh, but I also like burrata. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good stuff, too. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Is there anything that I did not ask that you feel like, you know, you just you want to share with the folks about yourself personally or um, issue issue wise that, you know, you're, you're working on on your campaign? Uh, no, I just think that it's, you know, the AG's race is one where there are some some very clear differences at stake, uh, important issues at stake and some clear differences. Um, And, you know, like I said, I think we need new leadership when it comes to fighting crime and getting justice for Wisconsinites. I think we need an AG who's going to be serious about uh, enforcing our uh, environmental laws and our consumer protection laws. And I think we need an AG who's going to be uh, independent and a watchdog for Wisconsinites. Um, That's the kind of change I want to bring to the office. Thank you for listening to Wedge Issues. We'll be back every week on Friday with new episodes, so make sure you're subscribed and tell your friends to do the same. If you have any feedback or suggestions, you can email me at j-o-p-o-i-e-n at madison.com, or you can find me on Twitter at Jesse Opie. If you like what you hear on Wedge Issues, you should check out our other Cap Times podcasts like The Mad Splainers and The Corner Table. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>